As long as you live, there's always something waiting. And even if it's bad, and you know it's bad, what can you do? You can't stop living. This is a quote from Truman Capote's book, In Cold Blood. That book was found on the Cassidy's coffee table. Who are the Cassidy's and what happened to them? It's like Capote said, bad things, unimaginable bad things. In this first episode, I'm going to take you to the small town of Milan, Ohio to explore a 50-year-old cold case. This small rural town was once best known for being the birthplace of Thomas Edison until the chilly early morning hours of April 1st, 1968. The town would awaken to a tragedy that would rock it to its core. People would gather here in the town's square of shops diners, bars, and other small businesses to speak of the horror and fear that now gripped each person as the news of the Cassidy family murders slowly trickled in. The brutal slaying of this well-known family was shocking, chilling, and incomprehensible to the 1,300 residents of this community. To better understand how this horrific crime affected the people of Milan, Let's first take a look at who the victims were. William Cassidy, age 41. William, or Bill, as he was known to friends and family, was from Detroit, Michigan. He and his family would later move to Huron, Ohio, where his father would serve as mayor for a period of time. William eventually joined the Navy and served during World War II. Once back home, his occupations would include operating a Sunoco gas station. He owned his own business, Cassidy Supply Company, which was a supply house for construction goods. And at the time of his death, it was reported that he was working construction in the nearby town of Illyria. William married Ann Hahn, and they lived with their two children in a farmhouse on the edge of town. Friends and family say that William was a great guy, a hard worker, and that he and his wife were just a happy-go-lucky couple. A neighbor was quoted as saying, Who would want to kill Bill? He never had an enemy. Ann Cassidy, age 37. Anne was from Berlin Heights, Ohio. Her father was a real estate broker and her mother was a school teacher. After marrying William, the couple resided in Huron, Ohio. They had two children, a son, Michael the oldest, and a daughter, Patricia. Anne, like William, was a hard worker and at the time of her death, worked at Andy and Willie's Tavern in Huron. The family moved to Milan just eight years before their deaths. Friends and neighbors said Anne was very well liked and had no known enemies. Patricia Cassidy, age 12. Patricia was a seventh grader at Milan High School. She was a member of the school choir and she loved kittens, of which she had several. She often babysat the children of her mother's best friend who lived just down the road from the Cassidy's farmhouse. Anne's best friend said Patricia was loved very much by her children. Patty, as she was known by friends, family, and neighbors, was said to have idolized her brother Michael. 
The two were especially close because their parents worked and Brother Michael looked after her in their absence. Maggie, the one-year-old family dog. Maggie, the final victim of these horrible crimes, would not go unscathed. Maggie was a black, curly-haired mutt and slept on the back porch of the Cassidy home. The one-year-old pup was very loyal and guarded the family she adored. Now that we've learned who the victims were, let's take a look at where they lived and what happened inside their home on April 1st, 1968. Much of the area where the Cassidys lived has changed quite a bit over the last 50 years. More homes and businesses have made their way onto the stretch of road that swept through mostly farmland with just a few homes scattered here and there back in 68. Though the house has been updated over the years and ownership has changed hands over time, the tragic memories of what happened within the walls of this lovely two-story home will never be forgotten. Three lives were taken in a matter of minutes that horrible night. Lives unfinished, the lives of Bill, Anne, and Patty. According to friends, neighbors, and co-workers, the Sheriff's Department was able to put together the following timeline. March 31st, the day before the murders, Anne and William attended a bowling banquet at a restaurant. This was the last time the couple were seen alive. No one noticed anything out of the ordinary. The Cassidy's dog was seen by neighbors that afternoon playing in the yard, running back and forth with no apparent injuries. March 31st, at 10.05 p.m., Michael, the Cassidy 17-year-old son, clocks into work at Andy and Willie's Tavern where his mother, Anne, worked as a waitress. His parents had given him permission to work the late night hours as a cleanup person after the tavern closed. Andy and Willie's Tavern was located in Huron, Ohio, just seven miles from the Cassidy's home. April 1st, 3.05 a.m. Michael is seen leaving his shift by a co-worker. Between 3.20 and 3.30 a.m. Michael is seen getting gas at Woody's gas station. From what information I was able to find, Woody's was located across the street from the tavern. Even if this is the wrong location, the other gas stations were very close by. The station attendant at Woody's verified seeing Michael there. 3.30 a.m. Michael tells the Sheriff's Department he arrived home at 3.30 a.m. He found his parents shot in their bed with his mother still alive. He found his sister Patricia almost bludgeoned to death in her bed, but still clinging to life. Michael said he panicked, got in his car, and drove to an ex-girlfriend's house to call the police. 4.04 a.m. Michael calls the Milan Police Department, who then notifies the Sheriff's Department of the crime. Michael drives back to the house to meet the Sheriff's deputies. In the coming days, the Sheriff's Department would release a statement to the press that read, this was one of the most gruesome crime scenes we have ever seen, an image that will stay with us for the rest of our lives. The perpetrator of this horrific crime used a 12-gauge double-barrel shotgun that the Cassidys kept on their back porch, and these are the wounds they suffered.
William had been shot twice at point-blank range. He suffered a shot to the head that had taken off the left side of his face. The second blast tore a large gaping hole in his chest. Bill was pronounced dead at the scene. Anne was still alive when authorities arrived at the rural farmhouse. She had been shot at point-blank range. The blast had nearly taken off the top of her head. She was rushed to a nearby hospital where she would die of her wounds an hour and a quarter later. Anne's certificate of death would list brain laceration and destruction caused by gunshot wound. The coroner completed the form by writing in homicide 4168. Hour of occurrence about 3:15 a.m. Patricia was found in her bed severely bludgeoned in the head, neck, and shoulders. At first, it was believed that the perpetrator used an axe, but this was later corrected when investigators stated that she had been beaten with the butt of the shotgun used in her parents' murders. Patricia, just barely clinging to life, was rushed to the nearest hospital. She underwent five hours of brain surgery. She was so savagely beaten, it would take 97 stitches to close her wounds. She had no other broken bones. Her injuries were largely confined to severe lacerations about the head and face. Three days after being admitted to the hospital, Patricia died of a fractured skull and brain injuries without ever regaining consciousness. Maggie, the Cassidy's one-year-old pup, was crippled by a direct blow to her hind quarters. The day after the murder, she was found wounded and shivering as she guarded Patricia's bicycle before being whisked off to the vets. After an examination, Maggie was found to have no broken bones but was hesitant to use her back legs. However, she was slowly gaining use of them. The vet's office was quoted as saying, the dog acts as if she's been frightened to death. Now with three murders on their hands, authorities scoured the countryside searching for the weapon, a clue, a motive, anything that would lead to the arrest of this cold-blooded monster. Police, detectives, Coast Guard, deputies, and even the sheriff himself plumbed nearby farm ponds in hopes of finding the shotgun belonging to the Cassidys. Powerful magnets were used in cisterns in the Huron River, but the gun was never found. As the days passed, rumors began to flow around the tiny town. Was it a drifter coming off the train tracks that ran close to the Cassidy's home? Was it a serial killer traveling down the Ohio Turnpike that was also near their home? Perhaps it was neither. Perhaps the murderer was someone they knew. With no arrests in sight, the residents of Milan would do what they could to calm their fears. Dogs were snatched up from the local shelters and used to guard their families as they slept. Doors that were once left unlocked were now locked, bolted, and double-checked as suspicions grew. The safety of living in a small town had changed forever, and in its place came the stark reality that maybe their family would be next. Every day, the locals waited for more information to be released. They would learn no more than what little facts we know today. So let's go over what we do know. There was no forced entry, no robbery, no resistance from the victims. 
The book in cold blood was found on the Cassidy's coffee table. Investigators thought because there were a few similarities in the Clutter and Cassidy family murders that maybe the book was left behind by the killer as a clue. Deputies were sent to a local theater to watch the newly released film, but found no connection to the Cassidy murders. Evidence gathered from the home by the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation included one spent shell casing found near the kitchen door that was sent off for fingerprinting, a piece of plastic gun stock found by Patricia's bed, some large pot bottles, and a pair of blue dungarees, which had no obvious blood stains, were also taken. Several other items were also taken into custody, but not disclosed to the public. With very little to go on, frustration mounted and all eyes turned on the Cassidy's 17-year-old son, Michael. Was it possible that one of Milan High School's football stars could somehow have a connection to these horrible crimes? This well-liked teen who took care of his sister and held down two part-time jobs? How could that possibly be? As popular as Michael was, a heavy cloud of suspicion seemed to follow him at every turn. To clear his name, Michael volunteered to take a lie detector test. In the presence of two relatives, his attorney, two deputies, and the prosecutor, an hour-long test was administered to the 17-year-old. Michael passed. The sheriff told reporters, it was a good test, but I wouldn't say it was conclusive. Michael wasn't named a suspect, and the investigation moved forward. But prosecutors weren't quite finished with Michael. In May of 68, prosecutors asked to hold a hearing to gain more information from Michael. Michael's attorneys objected, stating that the state was trying to lay a foundation to prosecute Michael through his testimony, and that Michael was not required to participate. Common Pleas Judge James McChrystal agreed and upheld Michael's right not to participate. Michael never spoke of that horrific night ever again. Eleven years after the murders, Sheriff Harold Gladwell sat down with a reporter to talk about the case. Gladwell said, I go back over it in my mind, step by step. We did everything we could. The sheriff was never able to answer the questions that bothered him the most, like how did the perpetrator make their way through the cluttered home to find a weapon and attack three people without waking them? What happened to the shotgun? Why was Michael wearing different clothes when deputies arrived than he had been wearing at work an hour earlier? And perhaps the most puzzling, what was the motive? Now here we are 54 years later with so many unanswered questions. A case of loose ends, rumors, and whispers. The home where the Cassidys once lived looks different now. Andy and Willie's tavern has been torn down. Michael has married and moved out of the area. And many of the residents who lived during these horrific and mysterious murders have passed away. What is left of the Cassidys' lives now sits in a cold case evidence box. We must never forget William, Anne, and Patricia, victims of one of the worst crimes ever committed in Milan, Ohio. They had so much life ahead of them before someone decided to abruptly snatch it all away. Statistics tell us that 90% of victims of violent crimes know their assailant whether it's someone close to them or someone they just briefly interacted with. I believe someone out there knows something that can help authorities solve these crimes. If you have any information, please contact the Erie County Sheriff's Department at 
7951. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Take care and be safe. I'll be back soon to explore another cold case. This is Eye on Justice.